This is my beloved wife, Marky, and uh, we are living today at beautiful Banana Bank Ranch residence in Cayo District of Belize. I am the area facilitator with the Latin American and Caribbean uh, region uh, for uh, Venezuela, Honduras, Guatemala, and Belize. And uh, together uh, we have been here then uh, for about four years in Belize. I'd like to present for, uh, your, uh, for your edification and for your enjoyment today, Reverend James and Anzi Sharp. Uh, they went out on the field to Uruguay the same time uh, we went out to Peru to start with, uh, way back in 2014. And so without further ado, uh, here's James and Angie. All right, hi everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we are celebrating our daughter's birthday today. Uh, so our daughter Maggie's 11. So maybe someday she'll watch the recording of this video. <laughs> Happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> uh, we are actually at my wife's parents' house in Denison, Iowa. We're just finishing up our home service this year and we will be heading back to Uruguay on Monday. We won't get there till Wednesday, thanks to the <laughs> wonderful travel delays that the uh, pandemic has foisted upon us. But uh, we are very excited to get back and get back to work. Um, I'm a pastor and church planter in Uruguay. My wife is an international educator. We're going to tell you about both of our ministries. Uh, we both I have calls as, as missionaries. Uh, Angie is a Seward grad and is a rostered teacher, and I am a graduate of Concordia River Forest and Concordia Seminary in St. Louis and am a pastor. I think I already said that. Um, so let's uh, let's get started. We welcome your questions. Uh, for us, we always like to, to get questions and we're much more interested in answering your questions and things you're interested in than necessarily getting through all of our material. I've also been told I was a former geography and history teacher. I've been told I need to studiously avoid <laughs> geography and history questions so that we can uh, main, maintain the time limit that we have today and respect everyone's time. So I'm going to really try to stay away from geography and that stuff. Um, all right, let's get started. Oops. Okay, well, there's my family uh, when we were at orientation in St. Louis in the summer of 2014. Uh, there are six of us, my oldest son, Elias, the guy in the very nice yellow shirt. Uh, my son, Ambrose, has a, I was at a foam green shirt, I would say, and a really neat look on his face. Uh, he is, for, uh, Elias will be 16 in March, Ambrose is 14. Uh, on my lap is my daughter, Callie, uh, who is 12. And on Angie's lap is our daughter, Maggie, who just turned 11 a few hours ago. So that's a shot of us in September. That's a little bit more what they look like now. Uh, Ambrose is probably a little bit taller than that uh, mm -hmm. since September. Uh, he's, he's close to catching up to me. I don't like to dwell on this picture too much because I'm, I'm not really into having kids taller than me yet. It's really, uh, it, it bugs me a little bit. So um, we live in Montevideo. It's the capital of Uruguay. Uh, Uruguay is a country in South America, in case you didn't know that, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be surprised how many people don't know that or confuse it with Uganda. All the U countries kind of get together. And uh, Uruguay is about the size of Missouri. It has 3.2 million people. And of those 3.2 million people, about half, 1.6 million, live in Montevideo and its kind of suburban areas around. So uh, we live in a big city in a country that has a lot of cows and grass and trees and stuff like that out in the out in the country uh, but we do live in the city and we live in downtown Montevideo just a few blocks away from where this picture was taken uh, this is our main church that we have in Montevideo it's called St. Paul Lutheran Church and there's a church and a school there it was founded in 1936 this building was built in 1947 and for a long time, this was the only Lutheran church in Uruguay, uh, the only Lutheran church of our confession. There are a few others floating around here and there. Um, but about 10 years ago or so, a little more than 10 years ago now, they really made a decision intentionally to reach out, to start new congregations, to reach new people, and to do church planting. And that 
decision led to them contacting the synod and that contact with the synod led to them asking for missionaries to help them and that's led to our being called and uh, sent there so and we've been there seven years now uh, like I said I'm a pastor I do pastor stuff like uh, preaching and teaching and administering the sacraments and and uh, all the your basic uh, pastoral functions but my role really is a church planner and so what i'm trying to do is to start new ministries and to reach new people and the goal is to uh, reach new people to catechize them to confirm them to bring them into the church and gather those people into new congregations and with the goal of eventually forming congregations that are independent and that can call their own pastors and then replicate themselves later uh, Angie will talk about her ministry in a minute, but really what most of us are trying to do is work ourselves out of a job. That's really the goal. If we can work uh, to the point where they don't need us anymore, then we really, really have had a, a successful ministry. Uh, there's a lot to do in Uruguay, so I think even if we are able to replicate people who do what we do, there's still going to be a need e either in Montevideo or in other parts of Uruguay, uh, but that would be the ultimate goal. It would be great if we could do that. Uh, Angie is a teacher at our school, St. Paul School, and she'll tell you now a little bit about her ministries. So as James said, my role is international educator, and that shakes out to about four different things that I work on. My <clears throat> first one that I'm going to talk about is I teach at our bilingual school that we had called San Pablo. And in this bilingual school, I teach math classes in English. Because it is a bilingual school, the students have their regular Spanish curriculum where the, the government sets the, the things that they are to learn and you're required to learn all of those things. But in addition to these things, uh, they have an English program where they learn English as a language, but they also learn other classes in English. So these students are preparing for an international exam and they will take a, an exam in English, uh, math, physics, science, and some other uh, areas. And this is a, a really good program. Parents love this program because it really prepares them well for uh, many different types of professions where you need English as a second language and you need to uh, have a pretty good fluency um, level of English. And by the time uh, my students are in my class, they're seventh, eighth, ninth graders, they do have a, a really good level of English. And, and I give my entire class in English, so they do really well um, in learning these other subjects in English. I teach math, but it is a, a Lutheran school. And so that means my real job is to, to show love and, and create relationships with these students um, so that I can share things with them. So I can talk about my faith, so I can share what I believe and why I believe it. Um, we're blessed to have a team of people that, that work with us. We have a chaplain that works in the school. So he'll pop into my classroom and share verses and, and he does service projects and things with the students as well. We have a parish pastor that's really involved with the students also. Um, and then other Christian education teachers and, and people from the church who are pretty involved in the school life as well. The other role that I have is teaching English classes. Most of these classes I have individual classes or group classes, adolescents and adults mostly for these English classes. And so most of my students that I have for these English classes are either parents of students that go to San Pablo and who know me, my kids' friends' parents, um, or I have a lot of immigrants to Uruguay that are in my classes. So I have lots of students from Venezuela, Cuba, Ecuador, and other countries, um, people from other countries who are now living in Uruguay and looking to learn English or improve their English to have a, a better job or a different position, et cetera. The students that I have that are parents at San Pablo usually have jobs that require them to, to learn English or have a conversation level of English. And so um, I really enjoy these classes because I really get to know my students. And similar to what I get to do in my English classes in the school, they become my friends and I get to know them. I think the thing that I enjoy the most when I'm doing English classes is I tell them at the beginning when they first meet me, you know, they always have a question, 
why are you here? Why are you in Uruguay? And I get to tell them I'm a teacher, I'm a missionary, my husband's a pastor, our family has been here for seven years now. Um, and they're like, oh, that's interesting. But usually once we get to know each other, then the questions come. And I love that moment when I have the class all planned and we're in that small talk part of our class. And then they, they bring out one of those big questions like what is baptism or what do Lutherans believe or how are they different from everybody else? And all of those plans go out the window and we spend a whole class talking about these things. And those are really wonderful opportunities that I, that I look forward to. So we use English as a way to make contacts and connections with more people, to get to know people as an outreach sometimes. Um, so it's a, a really beautiful opportunity for me. Uruguayans are really hard to get to know. Um, they are not a super open people. Uh, culturally, they don't make a lot of new friends. It, it's kind of the opposite of the Midwest, I think, mm -hmm. where everyone's, you know, cheerful and friendly and you're walking through the aisle in high V and everyone's smiling at each other and saying, hey, how are you doing? As if they've known each other for their whole lives and they don't have any idea who I am because I don't live here, but they act like they do. Um, it's kind of the opposite of that. In, if you walk through the grocery store in, in Uruguay, even before the pandemic, when we all have masks on, uh, people don't make eye contact with you. People don't strike up conversations with you. It's really hard to get to know people uh, even to meet people that you don't already have some sort of established relationship with. You either need an intermediary, you know, you need a friend to introduce you or a family member to introduce you, or you need to give them some reason to seek you out. And that's what uh, English classes do. They're, they're a great outreach because people want to learn English. Angie is a, a great English teacher and a native speaker. And so that gives us a, an in with people that we wouldn't otherwise have. It's, it's one of our most critical uh, Eng or outreach tools, really. Mm -hmm. The other big outreach part of my job, role in my job, is helping with the children's ministries that we have in the church. So I have a, a team of teachers and the parish pastor who's very involved in, in all of these activities. And in Uruguay, they're very uh, interested in education, especially of the children. And so a lot of our children's activities focus on that. And so we offer workshops and, and classes in various types of things, and we've had great success with these. So it started as uh, we were working with LHM, or uh, Cristo para todas las naciones, uh, the Solution Hour Ministries in Montevideo, and they were doing junior chef classes where we would uh, take a, a Bible person or just talk about the Bible or prayer or something and connect that with a recipe. And we would all cook together and they would take home things. And it, it was really fun. And we had such great success with that. We wanted to expand it. So I started um, some activities that we called Club Lab, where we would uh, do lots of different types of workshops. We've done crochet, theater, electricity, chemistry, among others. And again, always connecting it back to that religious component where we're teaching them about those things, but even more than that, you know, teaching them about who Abraham was and who Joseph is. And um, the really interesting thing is the kids that we get for these activities are really a mix from the school, the church, the neighborhood, and we've even extended invitations to the public schools in the area. And so we get a big mix of, of kids that come to our activities. And so we have a wide variety of backgrounds of how much they know about God, how much they know about Jesus. So we like to break into small groups, even though we have usually a large group, we break into small groups. So that way we can talk about what we learned and the kids can ask questions and we break them by age groups and, and into smaller groups as well. So you can see here in this picture, I had the, the little kids that day and they have lots of questions, um, but it really gives us an opportunity to, to kind of evaluate where their base is, how much they know, and to really make sure that they understand uh, what the lesson was that day. 
The last part of my role is, like Pastor Sharp was saying earlier, to identify leaders in our congregation. Um, this is a picture of Sophia. Sophia is a, a youth that started when she was in high school helping out with Sunday school and vacation Bible school activities, and just really has a heart for that kind of service with children. And she's a wonderful teacher. And she's kind of become my right-hand woman and helped me with many, many, many things. I'm very grateful for her. Um, and she's enjoyed her experience so much that she's interested in becoming a Lutheran school teacher. So she's earned a scholarship to Concordia Seward in Nebraska, and we hope that she'll be able to start there soon. Um, Angie talked about the, the school and, and the school's ministry. It's, it's really amazing. We, and it's a long story, which I'm not going to tell, <laughs> uh, but we do have this very large school. Um, and we, we have to thank the, the pastor, Pastor Mara Roll, who's the uh, administrator of the school, the headmaster of the school, I think we would call it in English, uh, has been there over 20 years. And the school had gotten to the point where it was about to close. And the congregation was really dependent on the school for a lot of things, for a lot of reasons. And the thought was, if they lose the school, they're going to lose the congregation. And like I said, this was the only Lutheran church of our confession in the entire country of Uruguay. And so they asked for help from our sister church body in Brazil, and they sent Pastor Roll. And he built this, rebuilt the school now to the point where next year we're gonna have 1,800 students. We have a very long waiting list. And so it's this big school, it's a great school. It's a respected school. Uh, people pay money to send their kids to, to our school. And that gives us both the facilities that we have. We have access to all these buildings and gymnasiums and cafeterias that a small congregation wouldn't have. But it also gives us access to 1,800 students and their families. And in church planting, that is invaluable. You could not possibly put a dollar value on having 1,800 students come through our doors day after day after day. Like Angie said, there's a, a whole Christian education and chaplaincy team that works in the congregation. Um, sometimes I, I help with them, uh, although my focus is more uh, in the downtown mission and church planning. But we all work together as a team to, because you know we have 1,800 kids and and uh, 3,600 parents and all, all that thing. There's plenty of work for, for all of us to do, but it's been a great blessing. And the, the, the school has continued to grow. And now they've hit kind of a plateau of what they can do. They can't add any more space. They can't add any more kids. And so the next step uh, as the school and the school board uh, starts to, to look at where they're gonna go going forward is if they want to uh, start new schools, perhaps, and and when in each of those schools would have a chaplaincy team and a, a pastor to do outreach and a chaplain to do uh, pastoral care inside the, the the school. So we're very excited about what's going on. This is a new building that was just recently opened. Uh, the poor kids got to go to their new building for four days, and then the <laughs> pandemic closed everything down. And uh, but we were able to actually to go back to in person courses, classes, mm -hmm. much faster because of the, the new building. This used to be a watch factory, and uh, it's something really beautiful also that the school has done for the community by taking this abandoned factory that had become kind of an eyesore and making it this beautiful building that uh, the neighborhood is really proud to, to see. So uh, it's exciting. The way that our school and our church work together, I think this is a good example of this. This is our confirmation class from this year, and nine kids confirmed. And only two of them, our daughter Callie, who's in the middle there with her arms on the shoulders of her friends, uh, looking very nonchalant, and uh, Trini, who's the girl to, to Callie's right, uh, are members of the congregation. The rest are all kids that were brought in through the school. And the, uh, the other pastor, I'm the bald one uh, there, <laughs> if you couldn't figure that out. The other pastors that are, that are with us, the, I'm going to call him the old guy, because uh, uh, I He's older than I am, not much older than I am, but uh, that's his mistake for having hair still, I suppose, is Pastor Christian Hoffman. He's the school chaplain and the head of the chaplaincy department. And then uh, to his left is pa Pastor Andre Mueller, who's the uh, parish pastor of, of San Pablo Church there at our main congregation. And uh, we work together uh, as a team, along with the Christian education teachers. And what happens in, in fifth and sixth grade, these kids are invited to uh, participate in after school 
catechesis, after school confirmation class. And it's completely optional. It's after school. They already have a very long school day. They start at nine o'clock in the morning and finish at 530. And then they stay an extra hour and a half for confirmation instruction for two years. And it's actually a, a pretty big commitment for a lot of kids. And, and we usually start with very big classes and not all, not all the kids uh, make it through. Uh, but we are very happy with the number of kids that have gone through confirmation and who have brought their families in with them through confirmation. Uh, we're seeing more and more of these kids who haven't even been baptized. We, we baptized three of these kids on their confirmation day this year. And uh, this is actually kind of a small class. Uh, I think pandemic had something to do with that too. Uh, but we're usually confirming around 10 to 15 kids uh, a year. And to compare, there's a similarly sized Roman Catholic school in our neighborhood, about the same number of kids. They also have confirmation, fifth and sixth grade, and it, but it's uh, mandatory. It's during the school day. And they're confirming about four or five kids a year when they're in a what it was historically a Roman Catholic uh, country. So uh, I, I think that shows that that we're really doing a good job of getting into the families' lives and uh, offering them, you know, presenting them an invitation to get to know more about the Lord, get to know more about faith, and to become members uh, of the church. And uh, most of the congregation now is people who have come in through the school, through the ministry of the school. And then what that does for us as church planters, now these kids who have come through and been confirmed, maybe they get a job, they move to a different neighborhood, or they buy a, their parents buy a house out in the boonies somewhere, and now they're starting to spread. And then we go and we kind of follow them to, to where they are, and we gather those people together, and that's where we get new uh, new Bible study groups, new home church, house churches, and and uh, Lord willing, that's where we're going to start building more uh, congregations. I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about that. I have some geography for you. Ha ha ha! Just kidding. I'll try to be really fast. Um, so this is where we have uh, our ministries currently. Um, this is a map of Uruguay. Like I said, it's about the size of Missouri, and most of everything we had was uh, in the Montevideo area. But, but now we have up in the left, I have a pen thing here, up, uh, ooh, laser pointer, cool. Here <laughs> in, in Salto, Salto is the second largest city in Uruguay. It's only about 200,000 people. And then down here in Paysandu is the third largest city in Uruguay, which has about 100,000 people. So there's a big drop off after Montevideo. Um, but we have a congregation here in a, a little town called Chapaqui where we're building a new building. They're just about to finish it. We're pretty excited about that. And we just installed a new missionary up there, which is great for me um, it, because not only is, is it, does it show that the mission is growing, um, I don't have to drive the five hours or so uh, on country back roads to get up to Salto once a month. So it's great. And these blue dots that we have are, are places we already have members living uh, up there. Um, and so Pastor Mike on, I'm going to show you a picture of him in a minute, is going to be able to, to connect with those folks that we have and connect with their families and their friends there. And like I said, the idea is uh, we plant new churches and, and uh, gather them together. I am screen chain. There's a question. Ooh, it just popped up. Where will the Josephs be serving? Uh, so that's an excellent question. I don't know if I'm supposed to answer questions. I'm sorry during this presentation, but I did. I'm so excited. Um, so let me back up a little bit. Or can I do that? How do I do that? No, I do definitely do not want to end the show. Um, can you just push the air button? Yes, I can. Um, so if you see the red, this uh, red area to the east of Montevideo, I'm going to show you a picture of that in a second. Um, but we have uh, so a lot of members that have moved out to the east of Montevideo uh, across the departmental line. It's divided into departments that are kind of like counties. Um, and Canalones is the name. And we're thinking that Phil is probably going to work in that area uh, and planting churches, serving the people that we already have there and, and working in the church plant uh, to the east. Um, this is just a blow up of uh, Montevideo. So you can see where uh, this is where our main church is, which is kind of a suburban area. And this is where we have the downtown mission 
and then these green dots are where the pastors live. We now live downtown, uh, which we did on purpose. The first five years we were there, we lived out really close to the to the main church and school. But we moved downtown specifically uh, to be closer to the uh, to the work that we're doing down there. This is a a, a statue. Uh, can you remember what the statue is called? Is it like Liberty or Victory yeah. or something like that? I don't know. Some disembodied concept uh, of some sort. Um, but this pillar is called kilometer zero in Uruguay. It's like mile marker zero. And all, all the roads in Uruguay, all these roads run to kilometer zero. So wherever you are on a road, if it says the mile marker is 284, uh, you know that you're 284 kilometers from that statue. And that statue is like two blocks from our house. And so we, we thought that it's important for us to be downtown because everything in Uruguay runs here. It literally all roads lead to here. And everyone in Uruguay eventually ends up in Montevideo for something. Lots of people move to Montevideo to go to school, to work, to shop, to uh, do paperwork paperwork documents. i, I tramites i always get stuck on that word uh to do yeah paperwork documentation with the government and, and things like that and uh we have these people that live out in the suburbs and come downtown to work and our main congregation is kind of outside of the lines of people coming downtown it's in a more suburban area and that made it difficult to connect with these people but being present downtown now we're able to connect with these people and we have these people that that go back to their homes, either because they're commuters or that they lived in Montevideo and then uh, are moving back after they retire. Uh, one of the blue dots that I showed uh, in the north is, is a lady that we had in our main or in our mission congregation downtown who's now retired. She's a retired nurse and she just moved back to her hometown. And you know, you follow them back to where they're from and then you gather them together and then you have little Bible studies and preaching points and then you gather those preaching points together and you have congregations and that's kind of the strategy that we're using to uh, plant churches. This was our mission uh, before the pandemic. We, uh, we closed this uh, location and are moving into a, a larger location closer to downtown. Uh, when we get back actually, I'm pretty excited. I got a lot to do to get ready for that. Um, so that's why we, we are, that's why it's so important to be downtown, especially in, in Montevideo. This is the mission in Chappaqui. Uh, this picture was taken in October. Um, unfortunately, the, the construction had stopped because of the pandemic and we just got started again, but it's almost done. This was, uh, like I said, this was taken in October, but this was Pastor Mike Hahn's installation. This is him. Once again, he's the pastor with hair, uh, so it's easy to tell us apart. Um, and he will be serving in that that northern northwestern area uh, in Salto and Paysandú area, planting churches up there. Um, this is the one of the Bible study groups that we have meeting to the east side in the Canalones Mission. Um, this is actually in a, a member's house. Uh, well, not in her house; it's actually in her barbecue. Um, but uh, it's very comfortable for us. But we've also kind of outgrown what we can do at uh, in a house, and so we're looking to to open a, a mission uh, out there. And that's probably to answer your question uh, where we will have the, the Jasephs uh, working there. Um, to, to finish up, I wanna talk about how we were affected by the pandemic. Um, everyone was affected by the pandemic. That's why it's called a pandemic, uh, but it, uh, it not everyone responded the same way. Um, you know, I know that there, there are churches that, that closed even during the pandemic. Um, we had no idea what we were doing with things like uh, transmitting the service and stuff like that. Uh, the first Sunday when we were closed down, the, uh, the, it was our vicar's first sermon. Um, we had a vicar from Brazil. It was his first sermon in, in Spanish instead of in Portuguese. And it was his first sermon on vicarage, and he didn't have any, all the only people he had there were me and the other pastors. Um, and uh, it was just literally uh, Pastor Andre's cell phone on a selfie stick taped to a uh, music stand. And that was that was what we had to go to go with. Um, but we've gotten better at it. And um, 
like I said, because we, we have so few places historically, uh, but we have these contacts all over. What it allowed us to do was to get our services into people's homes uh, where they would not normally be able to come to church. Uh, so it's been a, a great blessing really for us to be forced to do this and, and kind of forced to get out of our, our comfort zone and, and to be able to, to reach people electronically through, through social media, through uh, live streaming. So uh, we, we were able to make contacts with people that we wouldn't otherwise, people were able to share what's going on with their friends and their family members, people that would never have come to church because Uruguayans are very suspicious of religion. Uh, Uruguay is the most secular country in South America. It's like 60% atheist and agnostic. And so there are a lot of people that might be kind of interested in religious stuff, like spiritual stuff, because they just don't know anything, but they're never just going to come to church the way somebody might in the United States. And so uh, what this did is it allowed people to say, well, you don't have to go to church. Church, you know, it's just pop up on Facebook or uh, whatever. And we actually reached a lot of people we wouldn't otherwise reach because of that. Uh, we even had a group of people who got to know our church online, asked to become members online, did their catechesis online. And the first time they came to church was when we had the confirmation and reception of new members. Uh, so it, it, was, it was kind of weird, it's different, but um, we're, we're happy with uh, you know, the results that we saw when we were expecting this to be just absolutely terrible. Um, yeah, I saw that thing under there. So um, the other, another thing that, that we started doing is uh, social ministry or mercy ministry that we, we had done a little bit, but just kind of people that we knew, people in the, the area um, and not anything too regular, but we got a grant from the Office of International Missions Mercy Fund, and we were able to do a big purchase of uh, food. And there were a lot of people in need because the in Uruguay, there are a lot of people who work in kind of call it the informal economy that don't work. Uh, what do we call it under the table that work under the table, I guess. And uh, if you had a, a real job where you were paying into their Social Security, basically, then uh, they got unemployment benefits during the lockdown. And we were locked down, locked down for about a month and a half, I think. Um, but if you didn't, then you just didn't get paid. You couldn't leave your house. You weren't making any money. And so there were people that were really, really in desperate situations. And so we were able to respond to that in a way that we wouldn't have been able otherwise. And then what happened was really cool because uh, Uruguayans have this kind of spirit of, they, they always call it solidarity, like uh, being together, supporting each other. And, and it's, they're really motivated by that. And when our chaplain, Pastor Christian, brought this into the school and told them, you know, we're doing that. We've been doing this, uh, but we're running out. We're not going to be able to do it past uh, September or whatever. Uh, they started a, a food bank at the school. Like, we got to the point where we had so much, we, we had to tell people, stop bringing tomato sauce, uh, bring this instead, or uh, stop bringing cooking oil because we have enough cooking oil probably to cook for three or four years uh, for the entire country. So uh, it really, they had a great response to that as a way to get people involved. It's also a way to show people who might not think much of the church that the church really does care about people and wants to take care of people. And so this allowed us to get into neighborhoods and places where we wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, one of the drawbacks, I guess, of being so tightly connected with the school and having so much to do with the school is that that's a very particular culture from a very particular neighborhood. It's mostly upper middle class people who can afford to send their kids to a private school. And so that's really our constituency. And like I said, with 1800 students, that's plenty of work that keeps us busy, right? Um, but what this did is it made us go to neighborhoods and people and socioeconomic levels that we never would have before. And so between getting out the message, the worship service and, and Bible studies and stuff like that via social media and between getting out and showing love and mercy and Christian care, 
through the, the food baskets that we were doing, it really expanded the outreach of the church in a way that, that I don't think ever has before in the, in the history of, of this particular congregation and church. And uh, a great uh, example of that this, is this man, his name is Roberto. Roberto has cancer and a member of our congregation who's a doctor was taking care of him and was re responding to his uh, emergency calls. And he got to know her and he got to trust her. And he was telling people about how he, he was telling her, telling Gabby about how he's, he's really depressed and he doesn't have any hope and he knows he's going to die and this is terrible and he's in such pain. And Gabby said, you should talk to my pastors. You should talk to my pastors. And Roberto's an atheist. He's Uruguayan. He's like, I'm not going to talk to any pastors. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not talking to my pastors. And then uh, Gabby noticed that Roberto's wife uh, had lost a lot of weight. And he, she asked him about it. And he said, well, we're not really eating very much because neither of them were working uh, because of the lockdown. And so Gabby said, well, we have food baskets. Can my pastors bring you a food basket? And Roberto said, well, if they're bringing food, sure. Okay. And so we brought him a food basket and, you know, I, I said, okay, can, can we pray? And he's like, you know, you keep bringing food baskets. You can say whatever you want. I don't really care. And so we would bring him a food basket every couple of weeks and we got to know him and, and uh, got to the point where he knew us and, and trusted us. And so, you know, we'd always ask him, Oh, can, okay, can we pray? Yeah, sure, you can pray if you want, I suppose. And uh, then we asked, well, can we pray for you at, during our church service? And he said, yeah, okay, you can do that if you want. You know, just keep bringing the food baskets, right? And uh, so we would always bring the food basket and have a devotion and end with a prayer. And one time I was there and uh, was doing my devotion. And uh, I'm going to give you a little hint uh, uh, insight into pastor's lives. A lot of times our devotions that we do with shut-ins are our sermon from uh, the previous Sunday. Uh, so it was a, a short version of, of my sermon. And Roberto says, oh, that reminds me of, of your sermon from Sunday. And he was watching the service. And I, I just assumed he wasn't, right? Um, and so he caught me cheating a little bit. I don't think he realized that's what he did. But um, but this is a great example of how the pandemic made us go to people that we never would have gone to and how he heard the word that he never would have heard. And we were able to serve him and get into his life and, and be there. And we never would have been there. And so, you know, we've got Joseph and his brothers coming up this Sunday in the lectionary and, and uh, you know, what, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And this terrible evil has befallen uh, the world, which uh, I don't think was anybody's intention, but it, it, it was, it's bad. But God has used it for good for us in, in the Lutheran Church of Uruguay to reach people like Roberto uh, that we never would have been able to reach before. And so we're, we're actually, we're thankful to God for all the opportunities that he's given us to, to reach out over the last couple of years, even in the midst of, of this really difficult time. Okay, uh, I think that's it. We're open for questions. We're open Pastor for Birch. questions now, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Any questions? Let's see. Uh, David Steckholz, sorry I joined you late. Jevin, Reverend Jack. Yes, uh, Jack Price does work with us. Uh, the school now, um, about four years ago, uh, started a new foundation to run the schools. Uh, it's called the Concordia Educational Foundation and uh, Jack Price is a member of that board and has been very Im important in uh, the reorganization, which was very, uh, very important uh, for the moving forward for the for the schools and uh, of uh, looking into adding university level education, uh, which is still a plan kind of got derailed by the pandemic, but is still part of a plan for uh, the the school foundation, yeah. Hey, uh, James, I, sorry. Uh, um, that's a great uh, great story about Roberto. Do you think he will become a Christian? I hope so. Uh, we're working on him. I mean, why would he, you know? Why would he be watching the service? He doesn't have to. He knows he doesn't have to. We we brought him tons of food. Uh, we uh, his his wife makes empanadas, which are kind of like hot pockets. 
Um, and and I, I, she makes the best empanadas in Uruguay, as far as I'm concerned. And we've been uh, we've been the bu buying them. She makes them, and then we bring them uh, to Prado and, and sell them mostly to members of the congregation. And and we've been doing we were doing that before you know he said anything about that. Um, I think next uh, level is to say, ask him about maybe getting baptized and we'll see how that goes. Um, but, uh, but we really hope so. And we, we, you know, I pray for Roberto all the time. Um, he does have very advanced cancer. So his time is short. Uh, and I pray that this time of grace that, that God has given him, uh, that the Holy spirit does work faith in his heart. Uh, I don't know where he is now, but, uh, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I, I, you know, I hope that he will. Um, that was a great uh, uh, story about Roberto. Uh, are you still thinking about making a college, though, in uh, uh, in Uruguay? Yeah, the um, the like I said, the school foundation is is working on that. Um, the it, the plan the planned opening was twenty twenty one, which I don't know if you know, but some things happened in twenty twenty that kind of um, put that off. The biggest thing really was the government offices were closed for months. And, uh, and you know, anybody who's been involved with the school and accreditation and stuff like that knows that there's a lot that you have to do with the government and it's probably worse in Uruguay, frankly. Um, and so those uh, permits and, and applications and things just got so backed up that it, it really didn't become feasible anymore, but uh, they, they still do plan to add university level education to the school foundation. Yep. Um, well, here's uh, ha has to do with your your home life. Uh, do you homeschool your children? Not really. Our our kids go to the school San Pablo, our Lutheran school. Um, and so all of our children started when we first moved there. They speak Spanish better than we do. Uh, a lot of people don't know that they're not Uruguayan. Um, but we do add to those things at home in the summer. We'll work on English a little bit more to get them kind of up to speed with other native um, speakers. And then some other like things, you know, US history, things that they wouldn't necessarily get in the curriculum that they have at San Pablo. Spelling. Spelling is really hard. Spelling is really hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. Spanish, we don't really have, have spelling, spelling tests. problems, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the, and then our, uh, our oldest son, Elias, um, we kind of had the options to go to school there or to go to school here in the United States. And he chose to go to school here. So he's actually a sophomore at our Synod's boarding school in Concordia, Missouri, St. Paul Lutheran High School. The Synod does have a boarding school in case <laughs> most people don't know that, which uh, floors me. I, it's kind of a unique thing, but yeah, he's, he's a sophomore at Concordia, uh, Missouri, and will be joined in August by our second son, Ambrose. So. <laughs> Yep. Uh, homeschooling is actually illegal in Uruguay. Yeah. Uh, you're required to have a uh, uh, Uruguayan curriculum education. So you can add to that. But you can you add to, to that add. like we do in our school. Right. Um, but you must have this base uh, curriculum for, I think it's 10 years. Is that right? I think so. I can't remember. Yeah. It, it turns out to be a real blessing because I know that two of our, three of our children attended the uh, uh, a, uh, a secular school in Guatemala, and they all came out of there speaking much better Spanish than Marky and I ever did. And uh, and how embarrassing to have your children uh, that speak much better than you. They're great tools. <laughs> yeah, well, when I'm writing, when I'm writing, Ambrose, is, should this be Sea or Fuera? Sea, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that part's yeah. Now you you spoke about uh, the the diaspora the the Lutherans in several parts of uh, Uruguay. Uh, do you have plans then to do uh, more outreach in the rural communities? And uh, you know, and this is a question you're going to love because I know your answer already. <laughs> Are volunteer teachers needed? Uh, I'll answer the second question first. Yes, <laughs> uh, we we need teachers. Um, either as short-term mission team type things, which Highlanda, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, we did have a, a short-term team down there. Um, we could definitely use that kind of volunteer teacher. We also need career missionary teachers to, to teach in the school, uh, especially middle and high school, English, no, not English, math. English speaking, math, physics, 
biology, mm -hmm. chemistry. Um, so if you know anybody, uh, holler at us, uh, but we, we would really like that. Um, it, but we do plan, that's that's the big thing. Like um, that's what Phil will probably, Phil Joseph will probably be working on mm -hmm. some of those smaller towns to the east of Montevideo. Mm -hmm. That's what Pastor Mikon up in the north will be working out of Salto, but serving those, those areas. And what we're hoping is to create parishes of multiple congregations that then eventually can go together to, to call uh, full-time pastors. Um, one of the things that I, I kind of skipped, Angie said I talked about it, but I didn't because I usually do, but oh. an important part of what I do is, is leadership development. Like she said with Sophie, we do have some, some people who are interested in, in church work and are being trained for church work. We have one man who's doing the online seminary uh, that we have for Latin America. It's called uh, Pastoral Formation for Hispanic America. Um, he just is just finished his first semester in, in that. And then we have a few other guys that are interested in that. We have a, a few ladies that are uh, interested and in, we're probably gonna be forming uh, the first cohort of deaconess training as well. Uh, so uh, one of the things that, that we'll do then is hopefully in, in those rural areas that maybe we're not gonna have a big congregation that can afford uh, to support a full-time pastor, but we might be able to raise up people within those congregations to be uh, part-time kind of worker priesty uh, pastors and deaconesses. So yeah, we do definitely want to get into the rural areas. One of the things that the Lutheran Church of Uruguay, one of their goals that they set for themselves is by 2030 to have a ministry in all 19 departments of, of Uruguay, which is a little little ambitious, but uh, we're, we're shooting for that. So yeah. So you've, you've had several adults that have stepped forward then that, that want to be involved in church work. Uh, have any of these young people that attend the school uh, also had uh, expressed an interest in going on into church work? We have a couple of uh, boys. Um, well, one of the kids in the confirmation thing were the the boy, the boy <laughs> in, in, that the confer, in that in that confirmation <laughs> class. Uh, Benjamin uh, is is talking about it, and and he, he's definitely got the heart for it. He's yeah. he's a really sweet kid. So. Um, we're hoping um, there are a few Uruguayan pastors floating around the world. I think two serve in two serve in Argentina. Uh, one is in Kansas, actually. Uh, so uh, that's a funny world. Um, and I think one is in Brazil. Uh, but uh, you know, they there there have been uh, kids in the past, and and Lord willing, he'll continue to to raise up pastors and deaconesses and other church leaders uh, through the school. Uh, kind of a follow on to that. Um, I, the, the, um, the question is then, is Brazil the closest seminary to you? Uh, the closest seminary is in Buenos Aires, uh, just across the river. Um, and that's Spanish speaking. Uh, I think we have one man that's thinking about going to residential seminary and he'll probably go to Brazil. Uh, his Portuguese is pretty good. And uh, all the pastors, including myself, all attended that seminary. I was an exchange student there. And so, you know, it's kind of the same way. Um, my pastor had been on the staff at Concordia St. Louis. And so there was never any question that I was going to go anywhere but Concordia <laughs> St. Louis. Um, so, you know, uh, I think pastors are very influential in that. So I think he's leaning more towards going to Sao Leopoldo. Um, but the closest one is in Buenos Aires. And then the, the, our Latin American region operates a seminary now in the Dominican Republic, uh, which is also an option, but that's really far away. So, um, yeah, right, but uh, the closest one is in Buenos Aires. Okay. Uh, in the early part of the interview, uh, you suggested that uh, that your school, anyway, is in a fairly wealthy area. Now, is this an accurate understanding? That is. The, the main congregation and school are in, I would say, like an upper middle class. Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing as lower upper class? I'm not <laughs> sure, so. but, but <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's in a... a affluent neighborhood, I, I guess is the best way to say it. Yeah, that is that is accurate. So yeah, I've got a greeting here from Freeman and Susie Rolfing. Uh, oh, they were working nice. orientation back what? in 2014. And yeah. they just wanted to uh, tell you how much they enjoyed uh, the, the presentation and, and also seeing uh, us. And so uh, they were, uh, I think early on, you said you're in, in home service. Uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, they're asking if you're coming to the Fort Wayne area, but I think your time is short there. 
Yeah, uh, we'll probably go, be going to the Fort Wayne area in January of 2025. Uh, so uh, that's Make some plans. We were we were there. We were there in January, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, we were at we we stopped by Symposia, mm -hmm. and then also Saint we're at St. Peter's mm -hmm. in Fort Wayne. Uh, spent a day there. So um, sorry we missed you this time, but uh, we'll be back. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> hard to avoid uh, Fort Wayne uh, when you're uh, a <laughs> CMS pastor, you know? I mean, you, everybody ends up there eventually, so. So uh, a question about the climate there. Uh, you know, what's your weather like? Uh, you know, the uh, Carolyn, uh, she saw people wearing t-shirts and shorts and big winter coats. <laughs> and so, uh, are the people relatively well off, uh, well off there, or uh, is there a poverty issue in the country? Um, so, yeah. the, the first, let me answer the weather. Um, <laughs> it is a, a, a temperate climate. Um, I, I, I usually say that the climate's a lot like like North Carolina, mm -hmm. like coastal Carolina. Um, you know, it's hot in the summer. It's it's in the you know 80s every day right now in the summer. Um, it get, does get cold in the winter. Usually the coldest it gets is right around freezing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it will dip below freezing overnight and there'll be frost and all the Uruguayans will be confused because they think it's snow <laughs> and it's not snow, it's frost. It hasn't snowed since uh, 1908, I think. Um, but uh, the winter, I, you know, we're here in winter. We got lots of snow, especially when we were in Ohio. Holy cow. Um, <laughs> So we've had plenty of snow uh, while we've been home for home service, but um, the winter there is very, very painful and brutal. I mean, it's so humid. Yeah. And I always tell people, I, I worked in a meat market when I was in high school and every Saturday I had to clean out the locker and uh, you know the freezer. And I was in there with a hose, hosing down the walls and scraping all the blood and guts and stuff off the floor. And I was in there for a couple hours. And when I got out of there, you know, that cold just penetrates your bones. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it's like. Uh, you know, you, you go down there, you're in the, I'm an upper Midwesterner. It, it was 40 degrees below zero every day, all year where I came from, you know, and you get there and it's like 32 degrees. You guys are pansies back home. You know, we would be in shorts and a t-shirt when it's 32 degrees <laughs> and, but it gets you, man. It really is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something else. It's not, not pleasant and it's so dark and gray all winter and it rains all winter and I think that's worse than snow snow is at least pretty uh you know um and so we do we do have distinct seasons uh spring is beautiful fall is beautiful uh summer gets bad in January and and is pretty hot but uh uh but yeah and then uh the uh, people are relatively well off. I mean, it, the, part of it is that our, like I said, our main congregation is in an affluent area. Um, most of our contacts are people that send their kids to a private school and it's a, you know, it's a tuition supported school. So, I mean, they can afford private school that is, is not cheap. Um, I, I, Uruguay doesn't have a huge middle class, like upper middle class. Um, Uruguay, Uruguay is a, a working class country and uh, their level, uh, what's that called? Uh, level of living? No, how do we say that in English? Uh, standard of living, sorry. Um, their standard of living is lower than it is in the United States. Their houses are smaller. Um, most people don't have cars um, and, and take mass transit. Mm -hmm. um, they just they did americans have so much and they don't realize how much they have and their houses are bigger than everyone else's on the planet and they have more furniture and they have bigger cars and everybody has two cars or three cars or something like that and so i think the standard of living in general is lower than it is in the united states uh right. there is poverty there's definitely poverty um you don't have to go too far out of the big fancy neighborhoods to find it yeah. um you know, and and there there are there are neighborhoods where people are are living in shacks and there's no running water and stuff like that where they're kind of just squatting on on empty land and yeah. um, you know we have uh, we have been able to get out into those neighborhoods more and to minister to those people more uh, during and and now you know hopefully Lord willing after the pandemic 
than we were before, but they were they were trying. Uh, and, and especially we had folks from the mission downtown that, like I said, come downtown to work or whatever it might be and kind of found their way into the mission. Um, so we, we do get into those neighborhoods uh, before, but uh, not the way we have now. And in comparison to other Latin American countries, I, I think Uruguay is a little bit higher in that standard of living. Um, but then in comparison to the United States, it's a little bit different. Um, good. Uh, you know, uh, with regard to the uh, a bit of the politics of Uruguay, we're not supposed to get too far into this, the woods there, but uh, do you find that they tend to be uh, socialist communist uh, leaning? Um, I think that the best answer for that is what kind of what we consider the political spectrum in the United States is not necessarily the same as it is in Uruguay. Mm -hmm. um, there are policies there that I think we would consider leftists that they consider very conservative um, and vice versa. Uh, I think it is generally a left of center country, um, but it's also kind of culturally conservative in some weird ways. Um, so it's it's hard to to answer that like very strictly according to to what um, we think of in the United States, mm -hmm. but uh, you know that the the leftist the leftist party is very leftist. Um, so maybe that's the best way to say it. Uh, and they do have many social programs um, for their their people. So it uh, as far as that view, they do have those types of programs set. So um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, you showed a picture, I think, uh, where you had your mission site before, and there was a lot of graffiti and everything else, and that looked kind of uh, kind of like a, um, a marginal neighborhood. But uh, I remember when I, uh, Mark and I had the opportunity to visit you down there a few years ago, and, and that seemed to be kind of uh, uh, normal for a lot of different places. Uh, but uh, does your mission then reach into uh, you mentioned already uh, reaching out to Roberto and uh, to the needy parts of town. Uh, is your mission that was located there? Is that is that uh, one of the situations there with where you had your mission? We're always mindful of where we are um, in our mission. So a lot of the English classes that I teach are were started in the mission that's in the downtown area. So we take that into consideration who our, our public is for that area. So we do try to offer things that they particularly would be interested in and that aren't very expensive because they wouldn't be able to afford it. So we do keep that in mind in the different areas that, um, that we serve. Yeah, the, the, we do um, really the mission up north, the building that I showed in Chappaqui. Chappaqui is just a, a rural town of sharecroppers, basically of, of farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, it's not upper class or even middle class. Um, we did it when we first arrived there. They were working on planting a mission in a, a very poor part of town, mm -hmm. uh, part of Montevideo. Um, it re they really struggled. Um, they were kind of. I, I think they were kind of overwhelmed um, because when you when you work in lower socioeconomic class situations, uh, the mercy needs are overwhelming yeah. and um, it can be very difficult. But um, our downtown mission is in downtown, you know, and downtown is a lot like a lot of downtowns in the United States where you might have, um, you know, a lot of office buildings and then you very quickly run into a few that are residential and then boom, you're in, you know, inner city type uh, area. Um, so we kind of serve all, all sorts of people. One of the things we find though, is that uh, um, people who need help come to us. Yeah. Uh, and so we do kind of make more contact with folks who are from the lower strata of the socioeconomic classes than, than we do with, uh, with, with upper class people who, who, don't think they need anything that the church can possibly offer them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, you mentioned already, James, in that regard, that uh, that um, Uruguay is a very secularized uh, country that uh, 
you know, 60 percent of the uh, population there is either atheist or agnostic. And and so um, with regard to people actually attending church, if they aren't attending your mission, uh, is the, uh, is that a thing that comes up in people's um, uh, their daily or their weekly routine that they want to go to church or uh, is it pretty much, uh, you know, no, uh... Like I said, 60% are atheist, agnostic, no religion, anti-religious. Um, about 30% say they're Roman Catholic, but uh, the Roman the attendance at Roman Catholic churches is actually very, very low. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they have a shortage of priests. They have many, many parishes that don't have weekly masses anymore. Um, they've closed some, some churches. Um, Really, their only parishes that are doing well are the ones with schools, uh, for the most part. Um, so church attendance in general is low. Uh, there are other Protestant churches, but I mean, if you do 60 and 30, I think you can do the math that like all the other religions combined are 10% of the population. Um, but the there are evangelical, neo-evangelical Pentecostal churches, especially that have come down from Brazil um that have big congregations or, or relatively large congregations um with prosperity gospel type stuff um and and i do run into a lot of people that have kind of been through one of these prosperity gospel type uh churches um but in general um i, I think church attendance maybe canada is worse but other than that um in the western hemisphere it's the lowest no no, no country has fewer people in church on a Sunday as part of their population than Uruguay in the Western Hemisphere. Wow, that's uh, that's interesting, and that's uh, yeah, sad to hear too. Um, so, uh, James, there's just one other thing that I'd like to mention uh, on on your behalf, and and you just talked about your ministry in Uruguay, uh, but I'd also like to point out that you are an area facilitator uh, with the uh, with the uh, Latin American region. And uh, so you have responsibilities outside of Uruguay, and you, you cover uh, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Brazil, Peru. And so uh, the, the, this. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, I didn't mention it because I don't want to be area facilitator. I don't know if you know that, Herb, but uh, <laughs> that's why I didn't mention it. But yeah, I am the area facilitator for Southern South America. And and uh, it sounds like a lot of countries, but um, for many of those, we already have partner church bodies. And so it's more like I'm, if they need somebody from uh, the Office of International Mission, I'm their contact person, um, especially our sister churches in Brazil and in Argentina. I, I have no role there. I just, if they need to get a hold of somebody quickly, they can get a hold of me and I'll, I'll direct them to where they need to, to go. Um, the, the, the other church where I'm most involved is Peru uh, because I'm technically the supervisor of our mission team there. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's my area facilitator job. Thanks, Herb. <laughs> I, I know you're trying to you're trying to, to, to... trying to weasel out of it, but uh, <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, good luck no, with that. Good luck with that one, bud. So. Well, thanks a lot, uh, James and Angie. It's it's really great to uh, to see uh, how the Lord is working in Uruguay uh, through your ministry and and uh, through the Word. And uh, you know, we would invite uh, those who are attending today to subscribe to the the Sharps newsletter. Uh, and I think uh, Aaron is going to drop a link to that in the chat. And uh, you can also then follow them on social media. Uh, through uh, Facebook and Instagram, and uh, we'll also have that uh, in the uh, in the chat. And so um, we'd um, uh, like to uh, close this in uh, with a, a, a quick word of prayer and uh, give thanks then for the work that you are doing uh, while you're there in uh, raising funds and, and getting back home. Gracious Holy God and Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn from the Sharps about uh, the work that you are uh, that you are doing in Uruguay, and uh, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you have given us that word 
uh, which brings us to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and salvation. We thank you for uh, the work that the uh, Sharps have been doing there to share the gospel and to plant Lutheran churches and to show mercy to uh, all who uh, they come in contact with. And so uh, we pray for your continued blessings. Uh, we pray for your blessings on their return home to Uruguay, uh, having successfully completed their home service. And we pray for uh, their celebration of the resurrection tomorrow as they join other Christian brothers and sisters there in, uh, in Iowa. And so, uh, Lord, uh, continue to be with them and their family and, uh, and bless all that they are doing uh, as they continue to serve you and your kingdom. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.